again, thank you for joining us for today's Learning and Growing web webinar. Uh, this will be on Tweet Others the Way You Want to Be Tweeted. Our presenters today are Professor Crystal Trapani and Professor Jenna Ashley of Old Dominion University. My name is Sarah Chandler and I am on the training and support team here at Hawks Learning. Uh, we will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any um, questions that come up um, in that window, and we'll be sure to answer those. Uh, but on that note, I will go ahead and hand it over to our presenters. Thank you so much. All right, um, and we do have for everybody access to the materials, and I will drop that link in the chat possibly. Um, well, I'll get that in a second. While yeah. we're here, we also have our Twitter handles and our email addresses. And so you are more than welcome to contact us either way. Um, we do have a handful of objectives that we're going to cover today. Um, the, the first being that um, we are going to review who's impacted by digital access. We are going to assess some tactics to generate inclusive social media postings and recognize where and how to locate platform updates. And then I'm actually going to jump back since Jenna got that link and let us introduce each other. Uh, um, Jenna, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna is an instructional technologist with the Center for Learning and Teaching at Old Dominion University, and she is a former secondary inclusion mathematics teacher. Jenna is a Google certified trainer, a Google certified coach, a global GEG leader, and a Canvas certified educator. And I feel like that list grows every time I introduce her. She's also physically disabled, neurodivergent, and hearing impaired. She enjoys helping others make content that's accessible to all. And Crystal Trapani is also an instructional technologist here with the Center for Learning and Teaching at Old Dominion University. She's also an adjunct instructor in the English department here. And she blends her experience working with first generation and non-traditional students, curriculum development, creating interactive and accessible online course content, and training and mentoring faculty to help them achieve the most positive student outcomes and success. Um, and she helps her colleagues get a strong working knowledge of how to make course content successful for students of all learning abilities. All right. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is the access, who accessibility impacts. And really, everybody should benefit from your content. And there's actually four main types of accessibility when it, issues when it comes to digital content. Visibility, which is those who have low vision or no vision. And they might be using screen readers, high contrast settings, magnifiers. Um, and these individuals are really going to rely on not only document structure, but also things like alternative text. Um, audibility includes those who have low hearing or no hearing. Narration or video is often difficult for these individuals, and so you want to make sure you're adding captions and subtitles to your recordings. If you're doing a presentation, a sign language interpreter, live captioning should be included as you don't know who is hard of hearing or deaf in the audience. Mobility is the, there's two types. There is the physical mobility, which is that piece that most people think of when they hear accessibility, um, which is the loss of range of motion, but there's also, which I I would argue is more relevant for our conversation today, electronic mobility, which is the access to review documents across multiple devices. You don't know if somebody's accessing your social media via a smartphone that is brand new or is five years old. Um, and the final is cognition, which is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. And the other thing to think about is that, again, accessibility should help everyone. So these are some examples. We tend to think of disability only in those permanent ways, people that are blind, people that have cerebral palsy, those like me that are deaf or autistic. Um, but realistically, there are situational impairments as well. So just trying to work in a very bright light or a very dark space, um, someone holding a child or trying to use technology mobile uh, in the mobile environment, working on the go, working with that child while they're sleeping, the pandemic and the stress anxiety it's brought in, or even temporary things like a concussion, broken arm. We've all had a student at some point trying to figure out how to write with their arm in a cast, um, middle ear infections, concussions, like I said, um, long-term COVID with, it, with the, you know, the continuing impact that's got that's still not even 100% known. So realistically, it's important to remember that everybody is going to be helped 
when you make content accessible. Um, it is estimated that about 10% of people have a learning disability specifically. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think about it, that's one in 10 individuals. So in a, a group of 30 people, that's at least two to three most likely that have some kind of learning difference. One of our favorite quotes around here is uh, Corinne Gray, who's CEO of the Unconquer Revolution. She says, if you embrace diversity, but you ignore disability, you're doing it wrong. Um, in order to be fully diverse, you do have to accept individuals with disabilities as well. Um, realistically, making content accessible is common courtesy. You know, if you see me in my wheelchair struggling to open a door because I've got all kinds of things in my lap, you're going to hold the door open. If you see a, another person who's not using a mobility aid, who's trying, you know, got their arms full, most people are going to do the same thing. This is the same thing, just in a digital space. Accessibility is the same way. Um, it is something called the curb cut effect which says that everybody is going to benefit when you make things accessible. Most people have seen the little ramp at the end of the sidewalk, that's called a curb cut. Um, and way back in the 70s uh, out at Berkeley, they started putting those in because they had a number of students using wheelchairs. And to start, they had, they would literally schedule their day where they started at the top of the hill and had to roll down the hill as they went from class to class because that was the only way they could get around. And putting those curb cuts in not only helped the students that were in wheelchairs, they found that mothers pushing strollers, people carrying large boxes, anything like that, people will default to using those curb cuts in order to make everyone's life better. Um, the legal part of it is any institution that receives federal funding is required by federal law to maintain and provide accessible documents. Colleges, K-12 districts, dozens of schools, hundreds of schools probably by this point have been sued for not being compliant. Um, and it's called Section 508. It requires institutions to provide accessible content. It aims to make websites and apps and electronic devices, excuse me, electronic documents and software accessible to everyone, not just students, but everyone. Um, and then those WCAG guidelines, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, explicitly reference in that refresh section 508. So any content that you put out into the digital space, whether it's email or in an LMS or Google Drive, anything like that, must meet those 508 standards. The moment you put something in that digital space, it must meet those web accessibility standards. And if it doesn't, not only are you opening your institution up to litigation, but you yourself personally can be sued. And unfortunately, it's one of those things. It's like speeding. Ignorance of the law isn't going to help. And so currently under the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is WCAG, you are not required to ensure that your social media posts are accessible. But this is technically a gray area because any institution that receives federal funding is required to produce those accessible documents. Um, the current guidelines just don't account for social media. However, just because it isn't required doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to make them accessible for several reasons. And the first being that it indirectly communicates that you and your institution care about accessibility because students who need accommodations are paying attention to if an institution is distributing accessible materials. If you think about it, if you know you need closed captions, but everything the school produces doesn't have captions or machine only machine generated captions, you're going to think twice about before you apply there. Um, accessible postings are diverse. If you're not including those with disabilities in your content, then you're not being diverse just simply by definition. And the web content guidelines are always changing. WCAG 2.1 was released in June of 2018. Um, the original release date for 2.2 was November of 2020, which obviously ended up delayed like everything else. Um, and it, it's delayed until 2022. So just because the current guidelines don't require accessible postings does not mean that later uh, guidelines won't. And in case you're thinking, oh, well, you know, the government will get around to doing that later. Um, they have already created a social media toolkit and task force. So this is something they are looking into. And realistically, this is another one of those times where the 
written laws haven't quite caught up to the technology of the day. Yeah. Um, but inclusive design tries to make the experience positive for as many people as possible in a situation. And up until recently, social media didn't address those with disabilities at all. A 2018 Facebook study, in fact, found that 30% of people reported uh, difficulty, difficulty in at least one of the areas such as seeing, hearing, speaking, organizing thoughts, walking, or grasping their hands. Um, and Microsoft actually has three keys to inclusive design that you really should keep in mind when you're building any material, but particularly social media, because it does go to such a large audience. Um, you want to recognize inclusion, solve for one, extend to many, and learn from diversity. Um, because when you build content that isn't accessible, your, exclu your excluded audience normally doesn't complain. A uh, 20, uh, 20, I think it was 18 study found that 71% of them just leave. They just go, you know what, I'm done. I'm not going to mess with it. An easy way to be inclusive is to make sure you include closed captions. Um, a Facebook study found that content design for sound off was rated at having 48% more relevance and 38% more brand interest. And if you think your air quotes average user doesn't notice, you're incorrect. Um, we also we often say that to be accessible uh, just starts with generating accessible content. And a 2021 study by Google found that 64% of people surveyed took action after watching an ad that they considered to be inclusive. So your actions and choices, positively or negatively, do impact others. And Language matters. Odds are you proofread your post one last time before you press send, publish, submit, but language goes beyond that. You want to think about how assistive tools like screen readers will read what you've published. And while social media for your purposes is part of your job, possibly, you have to remember that your target audience is using it for ple uh, pleasure and just kind of interest. And so there is kind of an odd dichotomy between the two. Um, plain language, you want to make sure you're avoiding jargon and be careful with slang. There's kind of that really fine line to be walked in social media postings that are meant to be professional, right? You certainly want to use the language your target audience is using, but you also have to recognize that your target audience is diverse and you can never anticipate who is going to see it. So you really want to aim for no more than approximately like an eighth grade reading level and all social media postings. Click here. If you use any links, you want to make sure they're descriptive wherever they can be. Um, you don't want to use copy paste in that long URL because screen readers are literally going to read every single letter. Um, and you want to avoid click here because that doesn't tell any someone who can't see what here is where they're going. And if the platform you're using doesn't allow for descriptive links, you want to use a link shortener such as a bit.ly. Um, and think of it this way. If you don't want to read that whole URL, neither does someone using assistive technology. Emojis and emoticons. We see them all over Twitter, um, but they are read aloud by assistive technology. So you want to make sure, I think I, particularly the one you see the most is the clapping hands. A screen reader is going to read every single one. <coughs> And you want to make sure you're using inclusive language, avoid ableist language, and stick with gender neutral pronouns. Um, so there are several other things that you can you should keep in mind when you're talking about the visuals and your text being accessible. So first, before we uh, we talk about this, I'll let Crystal go ahead and play that lovely, lovely tweet. I want you to hear an example of what it sounds like when we use these fun interesting edit text you mathematical sans zeri vitalic small t mathematical sans zeri vitalic small h mathematical sans zeri vitalic small one mathematical sans zeri vitalic small n mathematical sans zeri vitalic small k it's mathematical script small c mathematical script small u mathematical script small t e2 mathematical sans zeri fold small d mathematical sans zeri fold small r mathematical sans zeri fold small one mathematical sans zeri fold small t mathematical sans zeri that's only through the end of the word cute in that tweet so it says, you think it's cute to write your tweets and usernames like this way, but you have you listened to what it sounds like with assistive technology, like voiceover. So that was just the first four words of that tweet. Um, so some things to think about as far as making the visuals of your text accessible. Full caps are misinterpreted by a screen reader. Many screen readers actually will read each letter individually when they're reading capitalized letters. So like, for example, we work with Old Dominion University, we frequently, you know, abbreviate that to ODU. Um, 
all of the times that you've typed your institution's acronym or times when you get your district, your school's name, um, you always say it as the letters. So if we type that as capital O-D-U, it's going to read it out that way. And that might be the intention. But for other words, it's probably not what we're going for. Um, another is hashtags and mentions. Whenever possible, you want to place these at the end of your post because many screen readers will read that punctuation aloud. Um, your font sizes do need to be uh, something that you're cognizant about if the platform that you're, allow you're using allows for it. Um, if Remembering that most users are accessing social media on a mobile device. We've seen studies that say every, anything from 80 to 99% of users are doing it from a mobile device. So adjusting the screen to be able to see those text pieces may be difficult for some, depending on their disability. Uh, special characters is another. You want to avoid those, those special characters when possible. Sure, they look cute to a typically sighted individual, but as we saw with that sample, um, they, uh, they don't sound so great when you're using assistive tools. Um, imagine if the, your entire Twitter feed sounded like that. Um, and then the last would be line length. Social media is consumed very quickly. Long posts are not going to appeal to most visitors. They can be difficult for those using assistive technology to access their social media. So longer texts are often collapsed and have to be expanded. We've all seen the the more button on, on Facebook, for example. So if someone has limited mobility, pressing that more button actually may be difficult for them. Um, one of the favorite, one of our favorite things to, to recommend to folks as far as social media is using what's called camel case. And that is where you capitalize the first letter of each word in a hashtag. So rather than that first line reading, hashtag Black Lives Matter, which is the intent, it actually reads it, the screen reader will read that as black lives, excuse me, black live smatter. And that's probably not the intent we're going to. So if you actually look at some of those, those were the, the some of the top YouTube hashtags for this year, YouTube is life, YouTube guru, YouTube content. The screen reader is going to absolutely destroy trying to read those. Um, so that's, that's always something to keep in mind. Um, the other is alt text and image captions. Normally we tell everyone with these kinds of things, you know, an image like this is here to add visual appeal to the slides. And this is a kind of image I could mark in my slide deck as decorative. But images on social media quite often aren't. And you need context in consideration when you're writing that alt text. So for example, the image on this slide, like I said, we've marked as decorative because in this case it is. But if this picture was part of our institution's website and we're trying to attract students, more descriptive alt text is absolutely necessary. You've got to consider the purpose and the audience of an image when you're writing your alt text. Um, if this was included in a page trying to attack, attack, excuse me, attract students to our College of Health Sciences, the only alt text that was provided for this image is College of Health Sciences. That doesn't give students any kind of information as to what's contained in the image, what they're looking at, or why it matters to them in, in this case. And for video recordings, we know that's very much a part of social media. And you want to make sure you're telling your story. An internal Facebook uh, study found that ads that include captions see a 12% increase in viewership on average. And remember that many people are preferring to watch without sound. In fact, another Facebook study found that 80% of people react negatively towards both the platform and the advertiser when a video plays loudly. And you want to try to ensure your story with that in mind doesn't require sound to communicate the message. 65% of people prefer to watch the first three seconds of the video, and then that will determine if they're going to watch the additional 10 seconds. Um, and then if they've watched past 10 seconds, 45% will continue watching for the following 30 seconds. So you want to really want to connect with your audience quickly and in a way that they prefer. 
audible descriptions and annotations are certainly something you need to think about when you're filming, particularly, um, you know, possibly on location, you know, maybe you're doing like a, a Facebook Live or something. Um, you want to describe anything that's you know, important either on the screen or around you that you're drawing attention to. If you say something like, see here, I'm here today. Well, where is here if you can't see where here is? Um, if you're making any sort of like annotations, you want to ensure that you're verbalizing those. Um, and you want to consider, you know, any the color to the extent that you can, especially if you're, you know, annotating over top of the video, you want to make sure it is meeting color contrast standards, which we will talk about in a little bit. You want to make sure your audio is as crisp and clear as possible. Um, and particularly if you're doing like a live event, you want to make sure you're setting yourself up for optimal sound quality because in you know it, it is hard especially if you're in a crowded environment so you want to do the best you can um if you have good audio your your viewership is going to be more likely to be engaged um obviously having like a headset is not always going to be po possible especially if you're like on location doing something um you know but a lavalier mic or there's those you know kind of big fuzzy things that you put over the mic that help reduce the outside noise um any, any way you can give yourself the most optimal sound quality. Um, you certainly don't wanna just use the built-in to like somebody's computer microphone, that's not gonna work. You wanna just try to do all the things you can, particularly for a live event, to get the best sound you can. Um, and it's it's much, much easier, obviously, if you have control of the audio, but obviously for social media, that's not always possible. Um, for videos, you wanna make sure you're describing any nonverbal elements. You wanna make sure, again, design for that sound off. Um, and and, and cure, include, if you're able, when the platform you're working on, include a transcript. Um, think of it, and when we say transcript, think of it as a visual script. Think of it as you are explaining what's there to somebody who's not there in that moment with you. Um, um, and one thing to think about is, um, as well as closed captions whenever you know possible. Because I can tell you as someone who's hearing impaired, I can't participate in a lot of things unless there's captions involved. Um, many people actually have found that captions help them as well that don't necessarily have a need. Um, most people consume social media with all their sound off. Internal testing at Facebook has actually found that videos with captions are more likely to be viewed and captions are more likely to help consumers of your media actually remember the content. And it's important to remember that each platform, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of them have different ways to add closed captions. Um, so in that slide deck that we shared in the chat, and I'll actually say that again, because I think we had a few people come in um, later. We'll make sure we put that in the chat before we leave. Again, um, there are actually resources to, thank you, Crystal to ways to add captions to Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, Instagram, all of the major uh, social media platforms. And when you're using color, that's something you definitely want to think about also, uh, because we probably most of us have had that moment where you're trying to match up a pair of navy blue and black socks, you know, like, let me go to the window and get better light. But imagine not being able to get better light to tell what color something is. And somebody who experiences a form of colorblindness um, is going to see the world very differently from you. Uh, somebody who has low vision or no, uh, they might override the colors you've chosen. And so you want to think about color contrast, which is the difference between the background color and foreground color. And your background color is the color that's on the page. Um, and the foreground color is the color of the text and images that are put on top of the background. And something you want to think about, especially with social media, is some people are going to view it like in air quotes normal mode, and some people are going to view it in dark mode. Um, so it's going to, you want to think about the fact that, you know, you might view your Twitter and, you know, it's the normal like light screen, but somebody else might be looking at it in dark mode on the, with the dark screen. But so color contrast is written and expressed as a ratio, one to 21, one colon one, it's a one to one ratio, is white text on white background, which I haven't met anybody yet who can read that. And 21 to one is black text on white background. So our, the slide, the text on the slide is white, the background's black, so that would be 21 to one. 
The first number refers to the ratio of relative luminance in light colors, and the second number refers to the dark colors. Um, I am not going to give the whole math breakdown because nobody's going to remember it. <laughs> um, but you want to think about, again, those, those colors being perceived differently. For example, on this slide, we've got these two young ladies. They're in a dorm room. They're laying on a, the one lady's on the, on the bed, and there's an aqua com comforter. I can actually, if I grab the right extension, where is my color blindly? There it is. I can watch what watch this the bedspread in particular because it's going to change colors drastically based on somebody's version of uh, color blindness. Um, I would almost argue this blue week actually makes the bedspread a little bit prettier. So that is something to certainly think about um, in that color contrast in relation to social media. And we do have, and there is a link in the uh, speaker notes of the slide deck. This will actually, you can put the picture you're thinking about using in, and you can put the text over it. So I have this little text box here and I could move it wherever I want. Um, and right now it tells me it's all failed, but I can actually, if I change it, I know it will pass when I do this. I'm like, let me make it bigger. It will tell me when I finally pass and where what's working and what's not. Um, so it, it's a cool tool we found the other day to use. But according to the World Health Organization, at least 2.2 billion people, billion with a B, have some form of vision impairment, which includes colorblindness, low vision, no vision, and blindness. Um, in fact, the Facebook's interface it's, here's some useless trivia for you, is actually blue because Mark Zuckerberg is red, uh, green, colorblind. There's also cultural implications to considering color. While red is often seen as negative within the US, people in China find it to be very positive. Um, and again, use that tool, check and make sure your image works on top with your text. And so, um, as we're kind of going through, you want to be open to feedback, right? Um, and think about platform changes and think about all those things together. Because social media is constantly changing. You have to keep track of the changes somehow. And a good way to do this is to make an appointment on your calendar for like the first Monday of every month, just to check the social media platform you use the most, to uh, uh, look at their accessibility updates. We've gathered the links in the slide deck to the major ones, um, but if you're somebody who is responsible for, you know, particularly doing social media for your institution, you might want to check more than once a month. Um, you know, so that, that definitely is something to think about is things change, um, you know, things get updated. In fact, you know, very recently, Twitter made an update to their accessibility uh, kind of rules and guidelines, so it is a good idea to go through and check. And it really is remember, important to remember there's there's two parts to social media. There's getting information out there, and then there's also planning events. Um, as far as getting information out there, in 2019 advertisements, male characters outnumbered female characters two to one. Male characters are twice as likely to be shown working, and male characters are more likely to be depicted as leaders or in positions of authority. Um, in, in advertisements. They're also more likely to be depicted as funny, while female characters are four times more likely to be sexualized and nearly twice as likely to be shown as partially nude. People of color are only represented about 38% of the time. LGBT plus characters are only shown about 1.8% of the time. And characters with a disability are about 2.2% of the time. Think very carefully when you're selecting images for your social media use because representation absolutely matters. If someone doesn't see someone like themselves, someone that they can relate to in your posts, they're less likely to engage with your content. Um, a lot of social media though also is arranging events. So be considerate when you're sending out event information. Ask something to the effect of, is there an accommodation we should be aware of to make your presence more positive? Is there anything we can do to make the event more comfortable or accessible for you or for others? Is there anything you'd like us to know as we plan and execute this event? Most of the time, you probably won't get any requests. Even just asking, you're bringing awareness and you're encouraging others to add that kind of nomenclature to their events. Because I'll tell you, we've, we've had people reach out to us and go, oh, I saw this, you know, 
listen to this story. How can I add that to mine, to, to my page? How can I add this? You know, how can I make sure I'm being inclusive? Hey, I saw this um, QR code on a flyer. Is that the best way I can do this? How can I make sure I'm being accessible with that? What's a good way to ask people what kind of accommodations they need? A lot of times there is some stigma for people with disabilities who don't want to keep being seen as needy because we keep having to ask for those things just to make them accessible as they would be for a neurotypical person, a physically abled person, a person without a visual difference. So it's important to remember, if you put it out there, you're showing that even if there isn't something that they need in that particular instance, that you're putting that accessibility at the forefront and it's not an afterthought. Um, and then, I know Crystal mentioned there have been some updates recently to, to the Twitter verse uh, as far as accessibility. They really tried hard um, and started doing voice tweets. And that sounded great until it didn't work so well because there was no ability for someone like me with a hearing impairment to be able to interact with those voice tweets. It's like, can't hear it, nothing, no transcript, no captions, no nothing. Um, and that's important to remember is you're gonna make mistakes. Twitter was public about theirs and apologized. You're gonna make mistakes. It's okay. It's a whole lot better to say, well, we made a mistake. We're gonna do better. Thanks for saying something than to not be accessible at all. Just coming today and listening you're getting new information, you're going, oh boy, I never thought of some of this before. Um, so that's a step. Um, and so we have some examples we're gonna share with you. We, we've tried to, to, to make whoever anonymous as much as we could, uh, but we are gonna call out some big name companies too. Uh, because while, while creating, the onus of creating accessible content does fall on the creator, you also wanna consider what you're resharing. Consider this tweet here. Um, the original tweet isn't accessible. It's the image alt text is literally image. Uh, that red does not meet color contrast. And when you go to the website, the alternative for the image is the same image in a Google Drive drawing which has no alternative text at all but this was retweeted what we retweeted when i took the screenshot 27 times so and then not to mention however many people originally interacted with uh the content so you know while the onus really is on that person who made it um it it doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily have been worked in the way it should be right you want to think about who is seeing it um i'm the other thing to think about is disabled users may utilize technology that overrides the colors in the document that you design. So again, color blindness or low vision. But it's also important to remember that images can be difficult even for non-disabled users. So if we look at a tweet like this, Canvas is a big name. Um, they're their own LMS. Um, the hashtags here for like Canvas by Instructure that is not going to be read that way by a screen reader. So one easy change to make here would be capitalizing the C, the B, and the I in Canvas by Instructure, Cam what we call that camel case. The image that's embedded in this tweet actually has no alt text. So a screen reader is just going to simply announce the word image, and the user is going to have no idea what's in it. Um, the word canvas up at the top in that logo actually has a contrast ratio of 3.09 to one, which barely meets that WCAG single A level standard, the bare minimum base level standard um, that is not the, the guideline for education under 508. And off to the left there with the E in educause has a contrast ratio of 1.59 to one, which does not even meet that single A bare minimum. So those are important things to keep in mind. Um, people are gonna look at something like this and maybe not be able to interact with it. There's going to be some you know, considerations of, well, is this company going to, to work with me on accessibility if I choose to interact with it? This is what they're, they're putting out as their public face. 
in this example, I actually grabbed from Domino's because Domino's actually in the past was sued for accessibility. Uh, and I said, well, let's see if Domino's has learned. Let's check. Uh, and so I pulled up, and this is kind of that under layer on social media and what basically how it's constructed. But that's what's going to let me go look and grab what the alt text is. And so I've got image alt. And this is actually when you go digging through and kind of deconstructing it. This is how it looks. Um, but that image alt is just image there. So that is, if I was using assistive technology, this is just going to tell me image. Um, fun fact, if you upload an image from like your phone or something, a lot of times if you've ever saved a, an image from your phone to like your computer, you'll notice it's like a bunch of letters and numbers and it's random and nobody knows what 0853P2 is. You just like, oh yeah, it's the file from my phone. Uh, sometimes, depending on the platform you're using, it will actually put that file name in as the image's alt text, um, which which obviously isn't going to mean anything. Um, uh, and this is another example. So Walt Disney, obviously another major company, very well known, very public. Um, again, the only alt text that's on this image of these folks, you know, in front of the Pixar lamp is the word image. So there are better things in here. Hashtag turning red. They've capitalized the T and the R with that camel case. The same for Disney Plus. They've got a bit.ly. Those things are wonderful. But a person using a screen reader has no idea who these folks are. I can tell from the tweet that it's you know, the body of the tweet that it, it says all female leadership, I can tell they're all women, but that's it. So it's important to remember what you put underneath is just as important as what is public facing. And we didn't want to give you all these, all this information today and not give you some tools that that's very important to us. Um, so the first thing is actually a very extensive um, PDF checklist for building accessible content. And while we gave you guys speaker notes for the social media pieces, we also realized what we've talked about today might give you some ideas on things to think about um, for other uses too. And so most major things like Word documents, um, PowerPoints, et cetera, we have the guidelines for how to make those accessible. Um, we also have this amazing, there we go, PDF, or not PDF, Google Doc of resources for accessibility. And we do have a section specifically on accessibility, accessibility in social media um, to give you some more ideas. But we are habitually adding to this document. So personally, I would tell you, grab the link and just check it every once in a while because we add to it often. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I really want to talk about is this accessibility fundamentals course. Um, if you have the ab ability to take this course you totally should and here's why um, Microsoft has done this big kind of push to work to make all their accessibility better in general um, and what this accessibility fundamentals course is they actually they built this big accessibility fundamentals course for everybody who joins and works with Microsoft they stripped out the Microsoft specific things and they are making it available to anybody else who wants to take it. Um, it's robust. It gives you lots of things you probably haven't thought about. Um, I know I took it and I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So it definitely is something um, that if you do have the ability to take that, definitely take the, it I, probably, it says two hours and 25 minutes. It definitely did not take me that long, um, but definitely is something. And you get a neat little certificate at the end to put on your resume and that's always good. We all always like that. Um, <laughs> so that certainly is something to do also. Um, but I would be remiss to not call that out. And at this point, we're going to go, who has questions? Because I'm sure somebody does. Do we have questions in the chat? We were chatting and I didn't even watch the chat. Um, let's see. So we have the chat turned off, but um, we do have the Q&A. So if anyone does have any questions and want to go ahead and put those into the Q&A, we have um, a few minutes that we can answer any questions that have come up because otherwise jenna and i will just ramble <laughs> <laughs> we will tell you all of the accessibility things I will drag over just to show people so they do know. Let me drag this over. When I say we've provided links to the chat for everything we talked about, there are, that was not a good example, there's only a couple there. 
but there is, here's a good example. How to do the camel case and such, how to add that alternative text. Um, where is the one about closed captions? I tr We tried to get links for all the major different social media brands. Um, so TikTok, um, I think I found, yeah, LinkedIn, Facebook. So we do, we have provided the best we could um, to, to give you that information for how to do these things. Because the reality is, um, you know, particularly with social media, things change daily seemingly. Um, and so, you know, what is the case and what is how you do it today very, may very well not be how you do it next week. Um, you know, so that, that is a good idea to kind of schedule that, go in and check. Um, you know, if you're somebody who uses social media often, maybe you run a professional Twitter, maybe you run your institutions, you know, Instagram. Um, those are things you are going to want to bookmark. Can you add alt text for images in Instagram? That is a good question. Uh, the answer is yes. 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 How do I edit the alternative text for a photo in Instagram? And fun fact. I, a friend actually like messaged me the other day, absolutely ecstatic, telling me that they have just added captions for Instagram reels. And she was like, guess what, guess what, guess what? Screenshot. So yes, all of the things companies are learning. So any company that is, has, uh, that is considered public facing is supposed to be accessible under ADA laws. Um, anywhere that is considered a place of public accommodation or receives federal funding can actually get in trouble and potentially lose that funding for not being accessible. So that, that's going to very soon start including their social media since that is how they interact with people in many ways. So they're realizing, oh, I should probably fix this. And just because, like we said earlier, just because it's not required yet doesn't mean it's not going to be required in the future. Um, and while, you know, we know that obviously you've come today to listen to us talk, you care about accessibility, you care about making your, your products good, um, it's, it's much better to already be in the habit. So when it becomes a thing that has to be done, you're already in the habit. You're like, oh. I don't have to worry about that. We're already doing that. Um, and that's always a great thing, you know, when your supervisor comes to you and says, hey, we need to start doing this. You can go, oh, we're already doing okay. that. I've already, it's not a problem. Solve we were, we, that's all it had for us. We, are, we already thought of that. It's also a lot easier to build with that accessibility in mind. And that's kind of our motto around here is if you do it from the start, it becomes that habit and you're less likely to have to try to make changes unless there is an update like that. But then it also gets other people thinking of, oh, I, I, as I mentioned, my friend, you know, told me about the captions on the Instagram. Um, they had never really thought about that. It was something that had never occurred to them that I sit there and I will skip all of those sections of Instagram because I couldn't interact with the sounds. So it's, it's important to keep that kind of thing in mind where you have to walk that line and, and go, what am I doing? How am I thinking of this from another's perspective? But social media is a very good example of collectively us all using accessibility things that we're not necessarily the intended audience for, but now here we are. Um, we've probably, many of us have had the moment it's three o'clock in the morning and you can't get back to sleep and you've picked up your phone and you're watching a video on whatever and you're not, you don't want to wake up whoever else is trying to sleep. Um, so it is certainly something to think about. Yeah, and it really, that's the thing. Um, there was a comment in the Q&A about um, captioning on Instagram because it helps when you don't hear the words correctly. That's common for a lot of folks. How many times have you heard a song for however many years and did not realize you had the wrong words? Yeah. I've had family members not believe me until I, played it with my transcription app on um, to show them actually what the words say. Well, it looks like um, there are no other questions um, at this time. Thank you guys so much, um, Crystal and Jenna, for presenting today um, and sharing all this wonderful information with us. Um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, if you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, 
please submit your proposal to the Learning and Growing website, which I will go ahead and link into the chat now. Um, but on that note, uh, we'll be emailing you all a link to the recording for this webinar once it is available. Uh, thank you all again for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.